Hey everyone, and welcome back to our electronics tutorial series. My name is Aaron from AX Electronic, and today we are switching gears. So last time we talked about op amps and diodes, and we mentioned that op amps are actually a collection of electronics components. They're actually a device in and of themselves, comprised of multiple different transistors and components and things like that. Diodes are actually the first look that we took at an actual individual electronic component. So it's not the sum of some other parts. It's actually itself a base electronic component. And now we're going to switch gears and start talking about transistors. And they are another example of a base electronic component. And the first transistor we're going to talk about is a MOSFET. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of your way, and we're going to start talking about a MOSFET. Now up at the top, we see a MOSFET is a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. So this tells us quite a bit. Semiconductor is the material that the MOSFET is made out of. It's usually silicon, but it can be a lot of other different types of stuff. Now metal oxide actually describes as part of the process of how a MOSFET is made. So if, I, if we look at a little cross section of a MOSFET, kind of like this, we have three terminals here. Okay, so we have three terminals. And what happens is that for one of these terminals, there is this thin metal oxide in between the terminal and the rest of the MOSFET or the body of the MOSFET. And what is in between that terminal, which is called the gate and the rest of the body, is a small layer of metal oxide. And that metal oxide is not conductive, so it's actually going to make sure that not a lot of current is flowing through. So very, very little current ever flows into the gate of a MOSFET. So that's where it gets its name, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. Now field effect is a little bit different. So I mentioned that not a lot of current flows into a MOSFET, but some current does, because whenever we actually apply a positive voltage to the gate of a MOSFET, some positive charges flow into that gate. Okay, so some positive charges flow into that gate. And whenever that happens, those positive charges are going to exert an electric field. And that electric field is going to attract negative charges. So what happens is that some negative charges will get attracted up to the very top of this MOSFET close to the gate and some positive charges will be repelled all the way down here. Now, once enough of those negative charges actually reach uh, close to that gate, once they get very uh, high in concentration, then a little conductive channel is formed in that MOSFET. So originally this MOSFET would not conduct current from one side to the other, but after we apply that positive voltage, after we have this field effect happening here that's causing these electrons to want to go up toward the top, it forms a conductive channel so that current will start flowing through this MOSFET. So it's kind of like a voltage controlled current source or like an electrically controlled switch. Now I have four examples of what's called an in-channel MOSFET here. We'll talk about the different types, but all of these are representative of in-channel MOSFETs or an NMOS. Okay? So what happens is that, like we said, whenever we apply a positive voltage to the gate, which is this terminal here, and all of these, the gate is on the far left, Make sure that's clear that that is gate so that's our gate then a current will flow from drain to source okay so it'll flow from the drain to the source now the source if it has an arrow it's going to have that arrow on the source so we can tell here this is the source here this is the source because the arrow is connected here same way arrow is connected here so it must be the source this one is a little bit deceptive because we don't know for sure and it's not very well labeled but if we do use this, I'll make sure I'm very clear about which is drain and which is source, but I don't think we're going to. In this case, the source is on the bottom. Now, that leaves the only other terminal to be the drain, okay? So those are the drains. So we have or gate, source, and drain on all of these MOSFETs. Now, the trick is that we have to apply a positive voltage from the gate to the source. So that means that Whatever the gate voltage is, it has to be higher than the source voltage in order for this current to start flowing. So if the source voltage is at 2 volts, even if we have a 1 volt voltage on our gate, that's still not a positive voltage from gate to source, so no current's going to flow in that case. Now something that I, that I didn't mention is that in the construction of this MOSFET, there is actually what's called a body diode going from the source to the drain. So I made sure I was very clear that current flows from the drain to the source. So current is going to nominally flow in this direction. But if we try and make current flow in this direction, then it's going to be immediately shorted by that body diode and cause a lot of current to flow, and it's not going to work the same way. So we have to make sure the current is flowing from the drain to the source. Now, like I said, this is an in-channel MOSFET. It's going to be the most common type that we're going to use throughout these videos. But there is another type that I think is worth discussing. So let's go ahead and move on to that. 
So this is the complementary MOSFET. So before we had an N-channel or N-MOS, okay, so N-channel MOSFET or N-MOS, the opposite is PMOS. So instead of N for negative, we have P for positive. So we have PMOS or a P-channel MOSFET. And it works very similar to the N-channel MOSFET, except there are some key differences. So it's kind of flip-flopped, it's kind of backwards. So we have, again, gate, source, and drain. Okay, so the three terminals are still the exact same. And remember, we said that the source is connected to this arrow, right? So this arrow tells us where the source is, okay? Now this one, it's flipped. And if we look back at the previous diagram, so for example, if we look at just this symbol here, if we look at this symbol here, if we look back at the previous diagram, we can see that the direction of that arrow flipped. So before the arrow was facing in, now the arrow is facing out. Okay, so that's something important to remember. That's kind of how you can distinguish between NMOS and PMOS. Now, for this one here, we're just going to assume that the source is at the top. The gate is easy to find because it is the terminal that is connected to kind of like this capacitor plate here. Now, this bottom left one looks very similar to the bottom left one from before. The only difference is that for P channel, it's going to have this little dot here. Okay, that's going to indicate that this is a P channel MOSFET or like the opposite. Okay? And that leaves us only the drain pin. So we still have gate, source, and drain, Okay, but for some of them it's kind of been a little bit flip-flopped. Now we said that this is backwards compared to an in-channel MOSFET, so now we have to apply a negative voltage from gate to source. Okay, So our source is up here, so that means in order to have a negative voltage we would need to have, for example, 10 volts here and 8 volts on our gate. Okay, so if we have 8 volts, that's a negative voltage. If we have 6 volts, that's still a negative gate source voltage. But if we have 10 volts on our gate and 10 volts on our source, it's actually a zero. Okay, so still no current will flow in that case. So we need a negative voltage from gate to source, and a current will flow from source to drain. So before we had a positive voltage, now we have a negative voltage. And then before, with our NMOS, current will flow from drain to source. Now current flows from the source to the drain, okay? So it does get a little bit confusing, which is why we're mainly gonna stick with the in-channel MOSFETs, but this stuff is still important to know because there are some key uses for these P-channel MOSFETs. Now, I wanna talk about the uh, what's called the IV curves for this MOSFET, or the way that these MOSFETs operate, because they're not quite as simple as a resistor. So something like a resistor, if we remember, if we have a voltage on it, the current is going to be proportional to that voltage, so it's always going to have a linear relationship. For MOSFETs, it's not quite as simple. So there are actually three operation regions for a MOSFET. Now, for both of these, I am plotting ID, which is our drain current here, so the current flowing from the source to the drain, or the current flowing from drain to source. So this is an in-channel MOSFET example, so we're going to consider ID as the in-channel drain current. Okay. Now we have ID on both of the Y axes, and on the bottom we have, for the first one, VGS. So VGS is our voltage from gate to source. So if we think of this as our VGS, that's what we're plotting here. For this one, we have something a little bit different. It's VDS. So if we go back to our in-channel MOSFET, our VDS is going to be the voltage from drain to source. So you can see we have VDS. We have VGS, so that's voltage from drain to source and voltage from gate to source. So that's how we're going to abbreviate those voltages. Now, let's try and identify some of these MOSFET operation regions, okay? So let's identify some. The first one that I can see very clearly is right here. So if I draw a straight line all the way up, I'll try and make it as straight as I can. This is called the cutoff region. The cutoff region. So that means that we haven't quite reached what's called the threshold voltage for this MOSFET. So in this case, it looks like that threshold voltage is at about 2 volts, a little bit below. And if we're not above that threshold voltage, we're not going to be able to get enough electrons up to that top or up to that conductive channel for current to start flowing. So that means that this MOSFET is in cutoff or no, no current is going to flow at all. So whenever our VGS is less, so this is, oops. This is where VGS is less than VTH, which is our threshold voltage. Now, once we get above that threshold voltage, then we're going to start seeing some current start to flow. So this cutoff region isn't too very interesting, but once we get above that threshold voltage, it does start to get a little bit more interesting. Okay, 
Now let's go to this VDS graph just to identify where this cutoff region is, and that is going to be here. That's going to be just this bottom here. So that is our cutoff region where we have zero current whatsoever. Now, <clears throat> once we start to increase our VGS and increase our VDS, some different operations are going to happen. So let's take a look at this far right graph here. So what we can see is that if we have a constant VGS, so if we have something like three volts, what's going to happen is that we start off with kind of what looks like a linear increase and then we kind of taper off. Okay, so we taper off and then there, our current doesn't increase really much at all. Let's take a look at this red curve here. So if we have our VGS of 10, we have this big long region where if we increase our VDS just slightly, we're going to have a proportional increase in current. So it's almost linear in this section. So if we take a look at this section right here, I'm gonna kind of draw a little boundary. This section is called our linear or our triode region. Okay, so triode region. And what this is saying is that whenever we have an increase in VDS, so if we increase VDS just slightly, so if we go just slightly to the right, we're going to have a proportional increase in ID. So if we have delta ID and delta VDS, okay, so if, uh, if we have this increase in VDS, we have a proportional increase in ID. So what does this look like? Right now, this kind of looks like a resistor. So this looks purely linear which is exactly what a resistor is. So this is saying if we increase that drain source voltage, then we're increasing that drain current by a proportional amount. So in this triode region, our MOSFET kind of behaves like just a resistor between, <clears throat> excuse me, between drain and source, okay? So this is called our triode region here. Now let's try and identify this region on this other graph here. So what we can see is that before, if we kept VGS constant at 10, uh, we're kind of trying to isolate the effects. So we don't want to uh, we don't want to take into account VGS and VDS uh, both changing our current because then that causes second order effects. It can be confusing. So we want to kind of look at an area where there is only a change caused by VDS. Okay. So let's take a look at this graph on the left. So here we see that if we increase our gate source voltage here, we look pretty flat. So if we increase our gate source voltage, it looks very flat and we're not going to increase our current much at all. So that should kind of give you a hint that right about here, this is our triode region. And it's just, just the same thing. So it, uh, we're going to set a constant VGS, or no, excuse me, not a constant VGS. Uh, no matter what we change our VGS to, our current is going to stay just about the same for a constant uh, VDS. So if our VDS is the same, we don't want our current to change too much. So that's going to be our triode region there. Okay. Now, we also have a different section. Okay. And I like to talking on this right graph a little bit better. So this section over here, uh, so where we have this big section here, what this is, is this is a very special section called saturation. So I'm just going to write that here, saturation. And this is our saturation region. And what that means is that whenever we increase VDS a little bit more, or we increase our drain source voltage a little bit more, not much more current is gonna flow, okay? So not much more current is gonna flow. And we can see that it's very flat here. The only way we're gonna change our current is by changing VGS, okay? Now, this is found on this section, on this graph here, okay? So this section, we can see that no matter what our VDS is, excuse me, well, no matter what our VDS is in this case, our current is still the same, okay? So our current is still the same, which is what we want. And we can also see that if we increase VGS, if we just look at this red curve, if we increase VGS just a little bit, our ID changes quite a bit. So this is also kind of like a linear relationship between VGS and ID. So if we increase VGS a little bit, we're actually impacting the drain current, okay? And this is pretty good because this is uh, kind of isolated. So we can change VGS, and we know not a lot of current is gonna flow into the gate of that MOSFET, but by changing VGS, we're actually changing the current through that MOSFET by a linear relationship. So we can use the saturation region to make things like amplifiers, right? Because if we have a, a small change in voltage on our input that could translate to a large change in current on the output which we know how to turn into a voltage using a resistor 
So this can actually be very, very useful for us in the form of amplifiers. Now this triode region, we don't want to work our amplifiers in this triode region because that means if we change VGS, it's not going to change too very much. So it's like uh, our VGS is almost saturated. I don't like using that word though because we could get mixed up with saturation. So it's like changing our VGS doesn't change our output, but changing our VDS does. Okay, so we don't want to build an amplifier in the triode region, so we want to build an amplifier in the saturation region. For the triode region, we're mainly going to be operating as a switch, okay? So this is a nice brief introduction to these MOSFETs. If you're getting confused by all this, don't worry. It will make more sense once you get some hands-on experience with it. So in the next video, we're actually going to start looking at how to simulate these MOSFETs and actually how to make these exact graphs. So you're going to learn quite a bit on how to simulate these MOSFETs in LTSpice and also just learn some cool LTSpice tricks on how to make these cool looking graphs. So if you do have questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I'm more than happy to answer them. If you like this content, give me a thumbs up and subscribe to see more. It really does motivate me quite a bit to see new subscribers and new likes. And other than that, thank you guys for watching and I will see you next time.